Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this time of worship. It is good to be together, even in this way. Um, we can express our solidarity and our communion as brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to everyone in the parking lot. Welcome to those joining by the live video feed, and welcome to you who are here in person. This afternoon, our call to worship is taken from the 11th chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans, verse 36. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Please rise as you are able. Brothers and sisters, from where does our help come? Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This afternoon we are going to consider the truth of the Eighth Commandment, you shall not steal, and built into that commandment is the awareness that God is the owner of all things. So let us sing about God's ownership of all things in Psalm 24, stanzas 1, 2, and 3. Let us join our hearts in calling upon the name of the Lord. Our Father who is in heaven, we come before you this afternoon to thank you for the opportunity once more to be together as your holy people, as those whom you have called and chosen to be your very own. We thank you for the communion which we have with you, and we pray that you will strengthen that communion this afternoon through our gathering around your holy and infallible word. We thank you that you have entrusted to the church of all ages the beautiful gospel of salvation, and we pray that we as a congregation would be a pillar and a bulwark of that gospel truth, that we would never compromise it or accommodate it to the spirit of the age, but would hold fast to it and preach it and confess it and live it boldly in the world. Father, we do realize that we have to be on guard in the world because there are false gospels. There are false prophets. There are deceitful philosophies that can entrap people if they are not living alertly and 
in a spiritual manner before you. And so we pray that we as a congregation would be given the necessary spirit of discernment so that we would be able to test things, test ideas and test doctrines and test ethical choices that are put before us. We pray, O oh God, that we may do this faithfully and that we would be able to know the difference between good and evil, between the truth and the lie, and that we, your people, would always treasure the good and sound doctrine of our salvation. Lord, bless us with your Holy Spirit so that we would be enlightened to understand and receive and to internalize the gospel message we hear this afternoon. We pray this of you in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn in your Bibles this afternoon to the Gospel according to Matthew. We'd like to read two portions with you from Matthew. The first one is from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6, verse 19 through to verse 24. And then a portion of Matthew 19. So Matthew 6 on page 1031 of the Pew Bible. And there Jesus instructs his disciples with these words. He says to them, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up treasures for yourselves in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, then your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So far from this chapter, let us turn also to chapter 16 of, rather, chapter 19 of Matthew, to verse 16. Matthew 19, verse 16. And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to Jesus, All these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold, and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. So far the reading of the Word of God. Let us respond to it. Uh, echoing the teaching of Jesus in the Psalms with the singing of Psalm 
37, stanzas 1, 5, and 7. afternoon we will continue our journey through the Ten Commandments of the law as God gave them to his people long ago at Mount Sinai and this afternoon we've come to the Eighth Commandment which is you shall not steal and we will discover the profound depths of this commandment as confessed by the church in Lord's Day 42 of the Heidelberg Catechism. So Lord's Day 42 and page 557 of the Book of Praise we read the following. What does God forbid in the Eighth Commandment? God forbids not only outright theft and robbery, but also such wicked schemes and devices as false weights and measures, deceptive merchandising, counterfeit money and usury. We must not defraud our neighbor in any way, whether by force or by show of right. In addition, God forbids all greed and all abuse or squandering of his gifts. What does God require of you in this commandment? I must promote my neighbor's good wherever I can and may, deal with him as I would like others to deal with me, and work faithfully so that I may be able to give to those in need. So far the confession of the church concerning the Eighth Commandment. Dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, Christianity is a material religion. That may sound a little bit shocking for those who are accustomed to think of Christianity as a spiritual religion. So let me hasten to explain that I do not mean that Christianity is a materialistic religion. It's material, but not materialistic. Materialism in philosophy means the belief that matter and energy are absolute and that there is simply no realm of the supernatural. Atoms and molecules are the sum total of reality in various configurations. 
Whereas a lifestyle, materialism means pursuing money and things as the highest end of life. Now, obviously, Christianity rejects materialism in those senses. But on the other hand, our Christian faith embraces the goodness and the value of the material world in which we live. It doesn't take very long in your Bible to figure this out. If you start reading your Bible, as you should in Genesis 1, then you find out that in the beginning, God created the material world. And God celebrated the material world. When he finished creating, he said, Behold, it is very good. It's exactly what I want. It's everything I envisioned. I called it into existence, and here it is, beautiful and perfect, full of glory. God created human beings in his own image and after his own likeness, and he created them male and female, and he said that that too is very good. We live in our Father's world. We don't live in the devil's world. We live in our Father's world. Creation is not inherently evil. Creation is good. Physicality is good. Atoms and molecules are good. Energy is good. All the created things that we experience are part of God's good creation. And we know that also from the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. He did not despise the physical world, but he became part of it. He was born in Bethlehem of the Virgin Mary, and he, in this way, entered into the physicality of God's beautiful world. So we have creation pointing to the glory of the material world. We have the incarnation doing the same. And at the end of the Bible, what do we find we find a beautiful picture in Revelation 21 and 22 of God and his people living, not in some super spiritual state of non-physicality, but in a restored world, a world in which Jesus will eat the bread new with us in the kingdom of his Father and will pour us a glass of wine as we sit at the banquet with him. And so from beginning to end, the Bible has a great deal to say about the realm of stuff, the realm of things and property and money. And today the Bible's teaching on all of these things comes to a point of concentration in the Eighth Commandment which says you shall not steal. This afternoon I will see with you how this commandment points us first of all to the pleasure of good things, the pleasure of created things. And secondly, how it points us to the peril of greed. And thirdly, it identifies the path of generosity. First then, the pleasure of things, the pleasure of property, the pleasure of physicality. You know, there's a video going around. Some of you I know have seen it, and maybe more will see it now. The video going around the internet uh, produced by the World Economic Forum and in that video, it, it, it tries to paint a picture for you of your future. What will your future be like in 2030 if the prophets and prognosticators of the World Economic Forum have their way? Well, uh, the video I'm thinking paints a picture of a future without private property. It has a line in the video that says, in 2030, you won't own anything and you'll love it. You'll love living in a world in which you don't own anything. You don't own your car, you don't own your house, you don't own the stuff in the, in the place you're living. And this, this video assures you, you're going to love it. You're going to love it when everything is collectivized. You're going to love it when the state owns everything. Or, in truth, when a few uh, elitists, aristocrats, basically own everything. You're going to love that situation when, when you own nothing and they own everything. Amazing how we're being conditioned to accept the future of world socialism or, or world communism, in which private property is no longer a thing. Of course, that's nothing new. Uh, we know that um, in economic theory, uh, Marxism and socialism have been espoused for a very long time. Marxism and socialism tend to see private property as the source of virtually every evil in society. If only we can eliminate private property, then we'll all be one happy family. But the inconvenient truth that puts a monkey wrench into all of that utopian dreaming of economic philosophers is the Eighth Commandment. 
The Eighth Commandment makes very clear, dear brothers and sisters, that God has ordained private property as his will for the world. God wants people to own things. God blesses people with ownership. He gives things into the care of people. Personally, he blesses people with his good gifts, and he wants people to have ownership of those blessings. If you think about it, if there was no private property, there couldn't be an Eighth Commandment. Because if no one owned anything, then no one could steal anything. Stealing, by definition, means taking what belongs to someone else and appropriating it for yourself. You know, a thief is very clear in private property. A thief understands very well that you own certain things, maybe the stuff under your veranda or the stuff in your garden shed or your garage. He understands very well that you own those things. But he wants to take them away from you and make them his own. And it's remarkable that once a thief steals something from a person, then he gets very possessive about what he stole. And he treats it as though he is the owner of it. In the Old Testament, we find God dealing with his people Israel in terms of private property. It's very interesting in the book of Joshua when the people of Israel came into the promised land after 400 years of waiting that the land of of Canaan was very carefully surveyed. I would love to know how people in those days did that. Uh, People who were into surveying in our congregation maybe can tell us a little bit about how that might have been accomplished. But the entire land of Israel from north to south was carefully surveyed and it was carefully divided up according to the tribes, the clans, and the families of Israel. And every family in Israel had its portion in the land. And one of the things that was done at that point was landmarks were put in place. And these landmarks are referred to very often in the Old Testament as sacred. And it was considered a terrible crime to move somebody's landmark. Uh, You know what I mean? If you go through a development, you'll see all these little white stakes in the ground with numbers and so forth on them. The surveying stakes are like landmarks. And Israel knew all about those, and they were usually marked with stone pillars and moving them was a big crime. For example, in Deuteronomy 27, we curse be anyone who moves his neighbor's landmark. You see, if you move somebody's landmark, what you were really doing was you were depriving him of something of his property. You were depriving him of his land rights. And God says, my curse is upon people who do that. I'm not just a little bit annoyed. My curse is upon those that do that. My curse is upon those who mess with the property rights of other people, who appropriate property for themselves that isn't theirs. And so it's pretty clear, just by reflection on these foundational things, that God ordains private property. And really, if you study history, all healthy human societies have understood the need for and the blessing of private property. If we own things, this is God's good gift to us. We can thank him for what he has bestowed on us, and we should enjoy it. And I think the Eighth Commandment is poking us and prodding us to enjoy the good things that God bestows upon us. Um, Do we enjoy God's gifts? God gives them to us to be enjoyed. I don't know what you're having for dinner tonight. It's a good gift of God to you, and you should enjoy it. I don't know exactly what kind of housing situation you have, but you have a roof over your head and you should rejoice in God's gift to you. And it's not spiritual to have God pouring gifts upon you and then say, Lord, but I'm, I'm going to make sure that I don't enjoy those gifts too much. That would be ridiculous. If you give your children a birthday present, you want them to enjoy the present. And when God bestows good things upon you, Uh, He puts things into your possession and under your care, then you ought to enjoy them. And it's not spiritual. Let me repeat that. It's not spiritual at all to refuse to enjoy God's gifts to you. In 1 Timothy 4, the apostle says it like this. I know this text well because it was a wedding text for Janet and myself. It is part of the wedding text anyway. 1 Timothy 4, for everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. Nothing is to be rejected. So don't say no to God's gifts 
Don't say to God, well, it's lovely of you, God, to put all this into my care, but I'd rather not have it, and I'm not going to enjoy it. I'm going to just, you know, deprive myself of all the good things that you wanted to bestow upon me. No, God says, I give these to you, and I give them to you with the expectation that you will enjoy them fully. And so, dear brothers and sisters, you shouldn't have a crisis of conscience if you happen to live at a nice home. You shouldn't have a crisis of conscience if you can afford a decent car. You shouldn't have a crisis of conscience if you can afford a turkey dinner with a good glass of wine. You shouldn't, enjoy, you shouldn't have a crisis of conscience if you can have a nice getaway on your birthday. You shouldn't feel bad if you have a nice speaker system for your, your sound, your, mu- your musical enjoyment. You shouldn't feel bad if you have a good snowboard to enjoy in the winter season. Instead, God would say to you, enjoy what I bestow upon you. I give you good gifts. Rejoice on them. Uh, thank me for them. And then glorify me by enjoying what I have given you. That's one of the prime ways, in fact, in which we glorify God. We glorify God by saying, Lord, we thank you for your gifts and we, re- we rejoice in them. And We're going to use them with a thrill in our heart of thankfulness. Now, of course, you knew this was coming. There are definitely any number of cautions that we need to add here. The first caution we have to add is that when God gives you things, and God declares that they are yours, then at the same time, God nonetheless retains his own ultimate ownership. In one of the foundational passages about um, Israel's arrangement with God in the land of Canaan, in Leviticus 25, the Lord reminds his people that even though they're all getting a share of the inheritance, nonetheless, the earth is mine. Don't forget that, Israel. Here you have your slice of land, your slice of the pie of Canaan, and I'm giving it to you, and I'm putting landmarks up to guard your share in the inheritance. But at the same time, don't ever forget for one second that ultimately it's still mine. It's still mine. That's why we sang Psalm 24 a few moments ago. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The fullness there means everything that the earth generates you know, fruitful crops or, or mines that yield precious gems and precious metals. Whatever the earth yields under human touch, the fullness of the earth is still the Lord's. Well, when you read Leviticus 25 or when you sing a psalm like Psalm 24, you realize that you need to be very careful with certain words in our vocabulary. And I'm thinking of words that are all about Possessing things. Like when you want to say mine, and that concept is very big to you, mine, this is mine. If you watch children, they have that concept in them very, at a very young age. Little boys and girls sometimes have big squabbles because something is mine, and it's not yours, and therefore hands off. We should be careful with that word mine. And the more important word is the word yours. Yours, O oh Lord. You should walk through your house once in a while. Just go through every room. Go through every room of your house. Do a little tour of your house if you have one. Go through a little tour of your condo. Go through a tour of your basement suite. Go through a tour of your car if you have one. Go through a tour of your office, your business, your shop, your farm. Just do a little walk through. And then in every part of that place that God has given to you, say yours. Yours, O oh Lord, it's yours. It belongs to you. You've entrusted it to me, I know. And I have rights over against my neighbors in regard to this property, but it is yours. It's not mine. You know, that's a, that's a revolutionary truth. If we would all understand that as Christians, what a light we could be to our society if, if we just made it clear by our whole stance in life that however great a blessing our things are and our our money and our property, we need to take a step back and say, Lord, ultimately, this is yours. This is what you gave. This belongs ultimately to you. Blessed be your name. 
And because the stuff that God has entrusted to us is not ultimately ours, even though it's legally ours, it's, it's not for us to decide all by ourselves what we should do with our money and our stuff. Instead, we should always be asking, Lord, you've entrusted dollars to me, you've entrusted things to me, you've entrusted talents to me of various kinds, uh, mental talents, uh, physical talents, economic talents. You've given me many talents, and, and Lord, you've put them under my care. And so please help me now to be a good steward of everything you put under my care. Help me to manage it in such a way that it's obvious that it's yours and not mine, and that my, my deepest concern is not to build up my own empire, but rather that through what you entrust to me, I may seek to hallow your name and to advance your kingdom and to do your will. You see, if people focus only on their rights, their property rights, without any regard for God, it's inevitable that the economic system of that nation will eventually fall apart. You see, without the dynamic of thanksgiving, without the dynamic of responsible stewardship before God, what will happen to society? Well, society will move seemingly in an endless pendulum between excesses. It will move towards uh, uh, an extreme form of free enterprise and rabid capitalism without restraint. And then the pendulum might swing back to some form of collectivism. And if you look at history, it's always doing that. It's always swinging between excesses. And we might be seeing one of those tremendous shifts right before our eyes today when we watch videos like the one I mentioned from the World Economic Forum. But you know, it's no surprise. Because if you do not have the fear of the Lord in your heart, and if you do not understand that all things you own are from the hand of the Lord and are to be used in responsible stewardship and thanksgiving, then corruption will set into your society. And your society will drift endlessly between these extremes and these polarities. And so what a blessing for us to be taught by Scripture the truth about money and stuff and affluence. What, what a privilege it is to, to learn the ethic of thanksgiving and the ethic of responsible stewardship of God's gifts. And so to summarize this first point, we can say God blesses his people with many gifts indeed. It's not unspiritual to value those gifts. It's not unspiritual to, to see them as God's blessing for you. In fact, it's unspiritual not to rejoice in them and to use them for God's glory. And so with all that perspective, the pulpit can say to the pew this afternoon, go home and enjoy your stuff. Go home and enjoy your treasures, whether great or small. Enjoy them to the glory of God in true thankfulness. That's the first point then, the first principle that we can say underlines the Eighth Commandment. But let's go on now to the second one, which I have entitled The Peril of Greed. Well, when your life is overflowing with God's material gifts, as is true for everyone in this congregation, the danger is that the gifts begin to matter more than the giver. And that's a very deadly situation. When the gifts matter to you more than the giver, then you are in a dangerous place as a Christian. And you can tell that the gifts are mattering to you more than the giver when your mind is preoccupied with your financial enlargement. When you think a lot about your financial enlargement, when you have already received many good gifts from God, but you're not dwelling on those, you're dwelling on additional gifts that you hope to receive beyond what you could legitimately need, then you have a serious problem. You have a discipleship problem. You have a faith problem. And it's a problem that's very destructive of true spirituality. 
Valuing the gift more than the giver is not just a problem, Jesus would say. It's also a tragedy. I think of the passage we read this afternoon in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus paints a picture there for us in the Sermon on the Mount of a person who is laying up treasures in heaven. Verse 19 of Matthew 6, let me repeat it. Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. Jesus is describing there in very picturesque language what we all experience in our lives. He's talking about how things in themselves don't last. They are consumed by what Jesus calls moth and rust and by thieves. Let's think of the first one first, moths. Um, I'm still old enough to remember mothballs. People used to have mothballs in their closets, and they stank, and they were terrible. But they kept the moths away. And why did you want to keep the moths away from your closet? Well, because when people used to wear clothing made out of natural fabrics instead of synthetic fabrics, the moths liked those fabrics too, and they would eat them. And so you went to get your special festive dress out of your closet, and Lo and behold, the moths had had their way. It was actually the larva of the moths that did this damage. And so in the time of Jesus, uh, clothing was very valuable. Think of the, the soldiers at the cross casting lots for the outer garment of Jesus. Why did they do that? Well, because that outer garment was worth a lot of money, that's why. Clothing was valuable. Uh, it was harder to create clothing than it is today in modern factories. Everything was handmade. Everything came from natural fabrics of wool and silk. And so if you had a, a good garment made out of white wool that had been purified, it was worth a lot of money. And we learn from ancient writers that silk, silk was worth its weight literally in gold. So if you had a pound of silk, that was the equivalent in that culture of a pound of gold. It's worth its weight in gold. Well, imagine that these precious commodities could be undone right under your eyes without even noticing by a tiny little larva of a moth. You thought you had something valuable, and then you didn't because of the moth larva. And then Jesus uses the word rust as well. Rust destroys, and for many years I, I thought this was about the rusting of metal. And we, we can understand how that can happen with, with metal. It can corrode and become useless. But the word rust here, I found to my amazement some years ago, doesn't actually mean the little rusting of metal. It can be translated simply as eating. Eating. So, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and eating destroy. So what kind of eating are we talking about here? Well, again, we're talking about the eating of insects. Think of a person who had a crop. He had a beautiful crop of wheat, and he was already counting his profit. He had calculated where he could sell it, how much he would get per pound, and he was counting on that fortune. And then, look, it happened. A big cloud of locusts came in and settled on the field. And an hour later, there wasn't one green thing left. Everything was eaten. Everything. And even if you managed to get your harvest in before the locusts came, and there is your harvest in your barns, like the big, the big silos we see all across the Canadian prairies full of wheat. And then, well, lo and behold, you went to get the wheat out to bring it to market, and you found the rats had got in there and the mice. And it was a big mess. Everything was defiled by these creatures, everything eaten and ruined. It's a picture, again, that we can understand of how even the greatest human treasures can be eaten away. You've got a great investment, you think, and then the market collapse, collapses, and you've got nothing left to show for your investment. And then the third scenario that Jesus points or paints for us involves thieves, and you have to think of a little town in Nazareth, like Nazareth or some other town in Judea. People lived in simple little houses, brick houses sometimes, and in the walls of those houses, they would carve out a little place and they would hide their coins and their gems there or their little 
their little treasures of silver or gold. And imagine coming home one day and noticing that somebody had chiseled out a hole in your wall and had helped himself to your secret treasures and you had nothing left. All your wealth went away in a moment to the thief. What is Jesus doing in these verses? He's, he's highlighting a crucial truth for us, brothers and sisters, that if you spend your life energy on trying to increase, enlarge your personal kingdom, your personal wealth, your, your personal stuff, then really you are setting yourself up for a big tragedy. Because even if the moths don't come and if the eaters don't come to your field and the thieves never find your treasure, uh, one day death will come. And death will make sure to separate you from everything that you were building up, everything that you had devoted your life to building up. It will slip through your fingers as you lie in the hospital dying, and you will see it's all gone. Can't keep it. As the old joke says, you can't take your hearse to the graveyard. Even though it's very interesting to see in the tombs of the mighty pharaohs of, of Egypt, they, they took all their treasures with them into their tombs. They built magnificent tombs and made sure those tombs were filled with all of their wealth. And they, they had some hope that somehow in the afterlife they would still be able to enjoy everything they had accumulated. And Jesus says this foolishness. And to prevent this tragedy, Jesus says in verse 20, instead, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. What does it mean to lay up treasures for yourself in heaven? Well, it means, congregation of Jesus Christ, that your greatest concern, your life preoccupation, is not the enlargement of your personal estate, but rather your greatest concern and your, your fundamental hope and your ultimate preoccupation is the coming of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ and all of its splendor and majesty, that that's what you're longing for, that's what you're working for, that's what you're devoting your, your wealth to, your energy, your talents, your time, that everything is, is about that eternal kingdom and not the temporal kingdom of whatever size you may manage to accumulate during your 70 or 80 or 90 years on planet Earth. In his first letter, the Apostle Peter, who heard these words of Jesus in Matthew 5, seems to refer to them when he talks about the eternal treasure of God's kingdom. He says in 1 Peter 1, verse 5, that we live with great expectation of an inheritance. It's verse 4, actually. Uh, we are awaiting an inheritance, says Peter, which is imperishable, is undefiled, and unfading, and is kept in heaven for you. It's like Peter was listening to Matthew 6 when he wrote that, and he wanted his readers to have a vision in their hearts of, of, of something that the moths can't get, and the eaters can't eat, and the thieves can't steal. And what they can't get is the kingdom of Jesus Christ, which is on the way. You see, why does a greedy person have greed in his heart? Why does a greedy person always want more? Why is the greedy person never able to say, hey, what I have is good, I have enough. I have food and drink and clothing and shelter. I have enough. I don't need any more. I don't need to accumulate more. Why does a greedy person keep saying, more, more? And he never says enough. Well, it's obvious because that greedy person is not focusing his heart on the priceless, imperishable, unfading inheritance that God has promised his people in the kingdom which is to come. You have to think about the kingdom which is to come very concretely. You know, think again of the land of Canaan. The land of Canaan is pretty small. It's just uh, 120 miles long and 35 to 50 miles wide. It's a very narrow strip of land. 
And God divided that up amongst the Israelites and they all got their slice of the pie and they got their landmark. And you should think of your future like that. You should think of your future like that. The kingdom is coming. It's a, it's a kingdom that will be on earth. God will live with his people on earth. And in that kingdom, you have a guaranteed place. It's so guaranteed that it's like there's a landmark already there saying, this is the portion of, and you may fill in your name. This is the portion of you. God has promised you a place in the inheritance. When the New Testament uses the word inheritance for the future, it's connecting to the Old Testament language of, of Joshua. The Lord gave his people an inheritance, Canaan. And Jesus promises you an inheritance. He says the meek will inherit the earth, the world, restored, purified, glorified. It's all yours. Christ is the king and you will reign with him over, over his kingdom. Now, if you don't know that, then all you have is the here and the now. And you have only your stuff now. And then what do you do? Well, then you want to magnify your fulfillment by magnifying your stuff. You always want more stuff because with stuff comes at least a little bit of a feeling of security, a little bit of feeling of fulfillment. And so you want more. You're never happy. It's remarkable that the, the greatest billionaires of our world today are still trying really hard to get more billions. They never have enough billions. Can you imagine that? One of the effects of this COVID time that we live in has been that the billionaires of the world became even more prosperous. So the wealth has been concentrated through COVID restrictions on the economy even more than it already was in the hands of a few. It's not healthy at all. And a lot of the middle class gets squeezed out. It's not a good thing. But the billionaires are never happy. They always want more billions because that's all they know. That's all they have. They don't know about First Peter 1. They don't know about treasures in heaven. They don't know about a kingdom which is to come, which is guaranteed. See, the only way to diffuse your greed, and it does live in all of us, this hunger for more, the only way to diffuse that greed and, and really to annihilate it, because you don't want to just manage your greed. You don't want to just control a little bit. You want to annihilate it. You want to destroy it. You don't want it to be part of who you are anymore. And the only way to do that, dear brothers and sisters, is to set your eyes on Jesus Christ and the kingdom which he has promised, which is coming. It will be a resurrection world full of beauty, full of glory, and you have in that world, Jesus says, a guaranteed place. I want to emphasize again that the coming world is not distinguished from the present world in that it's spiritual over against the present world, which is physical. No, the coming world is just as physical as this world. It's a world where, as I said earlier, we will sit at table with the Lord Jesus Christ and we will drink wine new with him in the kingdom of his Father. And as you live in hope of that perfect resurrection world, that world of life everlasting, you will find that you're no longer motivated by the need to always have more. The more you set your eyes on Jesus and his kingdom, the more you will be ready to say, thank you, Father, for your gifts, and they are plenty enough. I have so much already. I don't need more. How can a person stay on that path, that path of living for the kingdom, which is to come? Well, this takes us to our third point briefly, which I've entitled The Path of Generosity. It's through generosity, dear brothers and sisters, that you are able to keep your heart focused on the age which is to come. Generous giving is always a hallmark of true Christianity. A Christian is able to give because a Christian is not scrambling to get his share of the pie in the here and now. No, a Christian is living for the future, which is guaranteed. And so whatever a Christian has in the present, he is not loath to part with it because ultimately it's not his security. 
See, every time you give money to people in need through the deacons or through your private charity, whenever you donate to the work of the church so that the church's mission can continue in preaching the gospel of the kingdom, you know what you're really saying? You're saying to God and you're saying to the world, you're saying, I am free. I'm free from that crazy culture of materialism. I don't belong to that culture. I am free of greed. I am free of always having to have more. I'm free of that because my hope is in the age to come. And because I'm free, I am able to give without resentment, without begrudging what I'm giving. I'm free to share with those who have need. I'm free to share with the church. I'm free to share with all works of charity. The Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. We find that statement in the Old Testament and the New Testament. God loves a cheerful giver. So God loves when you give with a smile. God loves when you give with happiness in your heart and not thinking, oh, you know, I, I could have put that money over here in this investment fund instead. You know, God is really happy when you give happily. Why, is God love, why does God love a cheerful giver? Well, because cheerful giving displays trust in God, displays faith in God. Cheerful giving shows you know that your God is good and your God is faithful and your God is caring for you and your God has promised an incredible future for you. I would say to you this afternoon that if you find it hard to give, if giving is painful and you do it regretfully, then you need to do what might be called a personal eschatology checkup. Eschatology is the doctrine of the future, the future things which have been promised. And you should ask yourself, am I truly living for the kingdom which is coming? Or am I so preoccupied with present pleasures that future glories don't really speak to my heart? When I sing the creed, I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Do those words come from the deepest places in my soul? Or are they just surfacey words? You see, if they come from the deepest places of your soul, if this is the true conviction of your heart, that we are heading for the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting, it won't be hard for you to give, I promise you. You will look for every opportunity to give. You will enjoy giving. You will be free to give. Giving is a sign of true hope. And giving also, ironically, nurtures true hope. Maybe that sounds strange. Giving nurtures hope. Maybe if you're having a hard time giving, just give anyway, and you'll find that giving nurtures hope. What do I mean by that? Well, let's suppose that you made a choice to invest, say, $500 as a donation to an orphanage in Mexico that you know about because some Reformed people are working there. Let's suppose you did that. You, you sent $500. Don't you think that after you send $500, you're going to be more interested in that orphanage in Mexico? Because you have invested in it, you might say. You have put something of your life's earnings into it. And so that naturally pulls your attention to it. The rule is simple. The more you pour your life's energy and resources into the work of God's kingdom, the more you will be interested in the coming of the kingdom. And so if your generosity is lacking, you can stir it up by giving. If you give that first painful $100, $100 is painful for some people who don't make a lot of money. It can be very painful to give $100. But if you give that first painful $100, then you might find that the second $100 doesn't hurt as much comes easier. And the third hundred dollars, even more easy. The more you invest in the coming of the kingdom, the more the coming kingdom will capture your heart. It will fill the horizons of your mind. It's like Jesus says in Matthew 6, verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So if you sent your treasure already to the kingdom, which is coming, by supporting the needy, supporting Christian charity, supporting the church, supporting the mission of the church. If you're sending your capital ahead, as it were, to the kingdom which is coming, then the coming of that kingdom will be of greater interest to you. And so that's the choice we have. It's a choice you have. On the one hand, 
we can live for the here and the now, and we can join the mad scramble of everybody else in our society to secure their share of the pie and hopefully get a bigger share than other people. Or we could even defraud somebody to increase our share. We could steal in a shady deal. We can spend our whole life trying to get to the point when we finally would say enough. That's one way, laying up treasures on earth. Or we can live, as Jesus encourages us to, of course, with confidence in God's care and provision and with hope for his promised future so that instead of always wanting to get more, you have to be brutally honest about yourself here. Instead of always wanting to get more, you would want to give more. And you know when you're in that headspace, then you are where Jesus wants you to be. When you know it's more blessed to give than to get. And if you're living like that, then you're going to be using your money to build up kingdom realities. You're going to be happily using your money for Christian education as God gives opportunity. You'll perhaps think about the support of even Christian post-secondary institutions because that's just as important as Christian elementary schools and high schools. And you'll support the relief of suffering, economic suffering. Uh, you'll support the work of mission. You'll support the work of the local church because it's a kingdom outpost. You'll support Christian political action. You'll support Christian think tanks and Christian journalism and so much more. You will do this because you are looking to the things which are to come. Now, sometimes people say this is only for the rich to live like that and that radical generosity. I remind you of the widow's might. Jesus saw a woman put one single coin into the temple offering bag, you might say, and he said that she has given more than those who come in and drop in gold coins worth thousands because she gave out of her poverty. Um, I would say that every single person in this church is wealthy. Considered globally, every single person in this church is wealthy. I know we live in an expensive market, and I know that for young people, for example, trying to get into the housing market, that's very difficult. But still, we lack no good thing. We lack no good thing. And we have far more than most of the people in the world do. And so we have many opportunities for generosity. And so let me end this afternoon with some words from 1 Timothy 6, uh, verse 17 through 19. I'm going to read these words from the New Living Translation of the Bible. Teach those who are rich in this world, that's all of us, remember, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all that we need for our enjoyment. Notice that theme again. God gives us richly for our enjoyment. And tell those rich people, us, all of us, to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others, because by doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience the life that is life indeed. Amen. Let us respond to the, the sermon this afternoon by singing of God's faithful care in Psalm 146, stanzas 3, 4, and 5.
Let us join our hearts to the church of all ages, church of every time and of every place, by confessing our Christian faith with the church of all ages in the words of the Nicene Creed. Please turn in the books of praise to the Nicene Creed, unless you know it by heart, to page 494. Page 494 of the book of praise. Let all of you join with me in confessing your faith. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages, God of God, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made of one substance with the Father, through whom all things were made, who for us men and our salvation came down from heaven and became incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he arose according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who spoke through the prophets. And we believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. May I lead you in prayer and thanksgiving. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the clarity of your word as we have received it this afternoon. When we hear your word, it exposes the deepest things of our hearts and turns us away from sin and directs us instead to the path of life. We thank you, Lord, for showing us the path of life in regard to our material existence in your world. We praise you, Father, for the good gifts which you shower upon us every day. We thank you for our jobs, our businesses, our paychecks, We thank you for allowing us all to provide for ourselves and our households. We thank you for allowing the church to meet its budget during the year 2020. And we thank you also for the encouraging annual report of the deacons, which we could read this past week. We thank you for the generous giving of the congregation. And we thank you for the many needs which could be met through the work of the deacons. Father, having heard your word this afternoon, we earnestly desire to be good stewards of all that you entrust to our care. May we rejoice in your good gifts, and may we also be ready at all times to share them with others. Work in our hearts a spirit of thankfulness and with that of radical generosity. Father, as we think about these things, help us not to get stuck in the economic ideologies of the world, whether on the right or on the left of the political spectrum. Instead, may we simply recognize that we live in our Father's world and that we are accountable to you for our stewardship. Lord, we do pray this afternoon for the economic well-being of our nation. We pray that people might more and more reject debt-based living in our society. And we pray that government might encourage economic prudence instead of recklessness. We pray, O Lord, for the many businesses which have been deeply affected or even destroyed by COVID regulations. We pray for those who have lost their investments in this time or their jobs. And we do pray, O Lord, that in a time of adversity in our nation, people may turn to you and may learn to lay up treasures in heaven, placing their ultimate confidence not on their earthly wealth, but on the eternal wealth of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, looking forward, we pray that you would provide for the needs of our, of our Christian enterprises. We pray for the needs of our Christian schools, 
the economic needs, please provide richly so that schools can continue to function, that teachers can be paid well, and that infrastructure can be built as it is needed. We pray also for a clear vision for our Christian schools so that we as members understand clearly what it is that we're attempting to do in these schools. We pray that we may have a coherent vision of Christian education, help us to talk about these things and, and to come to clarity about them so that we don't engage in futile things. Father, we pray for the teachers in the schools. We pray for the administration. We pray for the boards. And we also pray for the continued freedom to operate these schools according to our deepest Christian convictions. Father, as we think about life in Canada today, we are concerned about Bill C-6, and we pray that it would not become law. We pray that the law makers in Ottawa would realize that this bill is an overreach of government authority, that it intrudes into Christian morality, it intrudes into the space of the church and the Christian home. Lord, we do pray that the government would repent of its authoritarianism in this regard and would leave room for the church to, to teach and promote a Christian sexual ethic in regard to transgenderism and homosexuality. Father in heaven, we pray this afternoon for the work of our seminary in Hamilton, Ontario. We thank you for the resources to operate this facility. And we pray that the work of this educational institution may continue. We pray for extra strength for professors and students as they cope with many layers of complications due to COVID. Father, please allow for good education to continue. We pray for men to come forth from the seminary full of joy, joyful conviction about the gospel and full of enthusiasm to preach it in the world. Father, we pray this afternoon for the families of our church. We ask you to give wisdom to fathers and mothers as they provide direction and gospel teaching for their sons and daughters. We ask you to sanctify the marriages of your people, to keep them free of selfishness, so that they may reflect the sacred mystery of the love relationship of Christ and his people. Lord, we want to pray this afternoon also for believers who are persecuted. We ask you to uphold them and strengthen them and work in them a strong and mighty comfort. We pray that you would bring to nothing those who would lay their hands upon your holy people in this world. Father, bring to nothing all the enemies of freedom in our own society. We ask you to guard Canada and to guard the United States against totalitarian, totalitarian impulses in government. We pray for government that is just, government that is limited. We pray for government that does not act that is, as though it is above the law, but with the citizens is indeed under the law. Father, we pray for our medical system, which in various places is strained. We ask you to bless doctors and nurses and other medical professionals who keep our system functional. We pray that you would keep them in good health and in good spirits so that they may provide timely care to those who are in need. Lord, we pray for the police services in our communities. Bless us with good and righteous men and women who, who wear the badge with, with honor and with a sense of public accountability and responsibility. We pray for their safety and well-being as they deal with many physical and emotional challenges in the course of their work. And so, Father, be with other emergency workers in our communities. Keep them safe in their jobs. May they enjoy the respect of all, and may they be a blessing to our communities. Father in heaven, bless us now as we return to our homes. Give us joy this week in serving you. And with the whole church, O oh Lord, we end our prayers by saying with all of our heart, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, come. May your kingdom come with glory, with fullness, so that we may rejoice in you and share in our inheritance forever and ever. O oh Lord, hear our prayer in Christ's name. Amen.
Once again, you are reminded of the privilege and responsibility of supporting the work of the deacons through your voluntary contributions. You can send your emails, email transfers to the deacons uh, with information they have provided. Let us close this service by thanking God for his extraordinary blessings to us with the words of hymn 85. Receive the blessing of the Lord and go in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.